Welcome to Craft Beer Store, a podcast dedicated to educating the masses across the planet on what real beer is. Hey guys, this is Craft Beer Storm, and I'm Mike. I'm the founder and owner, uh, brewer at uh, Bear Brewing Company in glorious Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, today we got a uh, special treat for you. We have um, Travis Benoit. He's from Bev.com, B-E-V-V.com. It's just started up. It's a startup uh, uh, platform where brewers can sell their beer directly to consumer. Um, there are challenges. Uh, the, you know, there are only a handful of states that are participating right now, but I know there's a lot of brewers out there that want to get their uh, delicious beer to you, a lot of local brewers. Uh, so without further ado, let's get into the conversation. And we're here today with uh, Travis Benoit. He's uh, from Bev.com, B-E-V-V.com, that um, he provides a platform for brewers actually to sell their beer directly to consumers. How are you doing, Travis? I'm doing well, thanks. And thank you, Michael, for having me and and for uh, your interest in Bev. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you sent me the email. We've talked about it in the past, and, and there are laws from state to state which, um, you know, they, they prohibit sometimes, you know, selling uh, interstate, intrastate. I know New Hampshire is a state where you can sell intrastate, um, but interstate, I mean, does New Hampshire have that, uh, or are they working on it, or how is it with New Hampshire? Yeah, so um, from what we gather, speaking to uh, New Hampshire, both lawyers and the ABC, um, New Hampshire offers uh, a flexible inter and interstate market. Unfortunately for New Hampshire, they're priced very high with regard to other states. Um, for example, if you look at states like Ohio and Oregon, um, we're looking at about a $50 annual direct consumer fee, mm. whereas uh, the state of New Hampshire is priced around $500. Wow. Well, let's back up a little bit and let's um, let's go into the story on on you know how you got started with this, uh, where you are now. I know you mentioned the fees that are are charged by state. Maybe you can elaborate on that, but maybe start with how you got started. Sure. So uh, I had owned a crowdfunding marketplace that was focused on the craft alcohol industry, and what crowdfunding was and is basically is a portal to raise capital for a number of different means, whether it's for uh, expansion, whether it's a startup, whether it's simply to uh, offer a new product. And we did okay with that platform. At the end of the first year, we went to get testimonials. And what we found out was that the money was great and all. Um, we successfully helped launch about 45 uh, producers, which was pretty cool. Um, but there was a bigger problem than the money, and that was the distribution channels. And this was when there were about 3,000 producers in the United States on the craft beer side. Um, you know, today it's three times that. But, you know, back in 2014, um, distribution was a problem then. It's an even bigger problem now. So um, did a little bit more of a little bit more research, started to take a step back and 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 realized that there truly was a distribution problem from the producer to consumer side. If someone truly wanted to get uh, the full skew of products from a producer, they actually had to go to the physical location because retailers, if they were lucky enough, carried maybe one product of your favorite producer and, you know, leaving behind 20 to 25 period. You know, so basically what it comes down to is that the smartest kid in the room, the IPA, the, the pale ale, would always get on the shelf ahead of all of the other interesting concoctions that breweries are making nowadays. So nice. we set out to build a multi-vendor marketplace to very similar to Etsy uh, that allows producers of craft beer and cider to take that online presence and build that into their own website. So basically what we offer is a online portal for producers to sell direct to consumer in compliance with the state laws. Um, and that's kind of where we're at right now. Yeah. And I mean, it seems very interesting and I think that's the trend of everything. I mean, you see Amazon is just blown up, you know, within the last 10 years and they're putting people out of bit. They're putting Sears out of business, JC Penney, all these big, big stores that people used to go to. People can go on their phone now if they want a, a, a shirt, 
of a different color made by a manufacturer. They can drill down all the way to the size and order it on like Amazon. I mean, it's just, so I think that, that that's where we're trending. And, and it's just interesting with beer. The issue is, and, and you know what bothers me about this, and that's why I wanted to have you on, like wine, you can kind of ship it wherever you want. You know, I don't know what, what the story is. I think they, they must have started a long time ago and um, the barriers to uh, shipping it have been eliminated. But for beer, it's just, it's ridiculous. You know, like I can't ship beer to anybody else without, you know, going through the, the hoops and actually it's against the law. If I shipped it through the mail, I would, I'd be arrested. It's a felony. Well, it's interesting you bring that up. So, um, well, first and foremost, I'll address the wine issue. And, and a lot of our um, a lot of our research around building this platform, and we spent quite a bit of time on the legal side before we started building the platform, uh, stemmed from the precedent laws of wine. And if you look back to 2005, there were a ton more wineries than there were producers of, you know, craft spirits, craft cider, and craft beer. So there was a pretty heavy lobby back in 2005. Uh, for the wine industry. The problem was, is as the industries grew and beer, micro distilleries and cider started to evolve and catch up, uh, it kind of got left behind. So as the wine laws continued to evolve, there had been precedent laid down already. So it was very easy to kind of carry that over into new states. And what ended up happening was, is, you know, beer, and like I mentioned, I'll just keep it simple and say beer for now, you know, beer kind of just got left behind. And now we're looking at kind of a conundrum because a uh, number of the states, you can have a cidery, a wi- uh, sorry, a winery and a brewery operating right next door to each other. And that winery can sell direct to consumer in 44 states, whereas that brewery is much more restricted. And it took a very long time for breweries to even be able to sell direct to consumer. It wasn't until 2016 that there was any true transparency um, outside of the state of California. And that's a whole story in itself, but we'll leave that for another time. So now it's a, it's a state by state thing because the states are controlling the alcohol and where, where it's, it's even, even within the state, they can control how it's sold. I think in New Hampshire, you can only buy hard alcohol in their stores. Um, in other states, you can buy, you know, hard alcohol wherever in a, in a stop and shop or something. But Um, maybe you can talk about how, you know, like if I want to ship to say California or another state, I have to go to that state and purchase a license from them for the right to ship to their state. Maybe you can elaborate on that. Sure. So, uh, taking a step back. So, uh, after prohibition, the United States federal level said, we think alcohol or we deem alcohol legal and taking it. Uh, a step further, they left the onus of, of, of law infrastructure on the states themselves. So you, the kind of the difficulties in navigating the alcohol state to state landscape is um, realizing that you have 50 states to work with in 50 sets of different laws. And um, so in order to do that, what, what ended up happening was, again, you know, taking the precedent laws of wine, um, basically the wine lobby kind of put some pretty simple uh, terms in place uh, started out. If you ship to me, we'll ship to you. And, you know, now it's evolved to 44 states, but in order for those 44 states to be uh, shipped to uh, a vendor in the wine space and the same with the beer space as well as cider, but we're classifying that as wine um, must get a license in each of the receiving states. Um, the onus of liability then falls on that receiving state. And, if you guys have questions with that regard, please feel free to email me because I know it can get very complex. But what I mean by that is um, if somebody in Vermont wants to ship beer to Oregon, for example, they need to have a permit to ship to the state of Oregon, which is $50 annually. You must report to the state of Oregon on an annual basis. Um, but double check that on their on their document just to make sure. Um but yes, in order to ship to each state, the receiving state needs to have a a permit. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, and and what? Yeah, that's interesting. It's from state to state. I know that, that you talked at the beginning about New Hampshire. I think you have to pay five hundred dollars for somebody to ship into New Hampshire. It's a five hundred dollar fee. Yes, it's the most expensive in the United States. It's like kind of steep. Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> but listen, uh, you know, how are you doing? I mean, are you, do you have sales? Are you in the beginning of this process? And how many brewers have you signed up? And, and what's the activity on your, your website and your business so far? Sure, Michael. Thank you. Yeah. So with that being said, we, um, we, have, we have live. We have launched two weeks ago. We have partnerships with a company called Delive.co and with UPS. Delive.co handles our last mile on-demand delivery. You can deliver out to plus or minus 20 miles from the producer. So you can have same-day uh, delivery. And UPS handles our carrier service. Um, that means interstate and intrastate. Um, we're doing okay. We're, we're pretty excited. So we had a long build time. And now we're ready to go for it. Um, we've been live two weeks now. We have uh, 20 vendors forward facing, uh, the majority coming out of the state of California. Um, we've got a mix of cideries and breweries of about 30% um, cideries, 70% breweries right now. Um, and, and, and that's where we're, that's where we're at right now. Um, we've had 175 producers in our pipeline, um, just going through the process of onboarding and, uh, really looking to kind of change the way that producers are able to reach their end consumer at this point. Um, you know, the re there, there's just there's just not enough shelf space. And by offering this new online means to sell direct to consumer, I, I, I hope and feel that uh, this will afford breweries and breweries the opportunities they truly competitive um, in this in this very convenient world that we live in where everybody expects everything to be delivered to their door. Uh, we'd like to afford that to the alcohol industry as well. Yeah. I mean, you know, for me, I'm a small brewery and, and our self distribution is okay, but it's killing me, you know, but it's, it's something that people want, like delivering it in cans and the snap caps and the labels, all that stuff costs a lot of money and that's the package that they want it in. And then you have to sell it at a discount to the store. Uh, and then the store marks it up and sell it. But if you go through a distributor, you even get you even get more killed, you know, in terms of margin. Um, you know, it's just eroded. So if there's a, an opportunity for a smaller brewer who makes really good beer to uh, send their stuff to directly to the consumer, I mean, that, I think that, that that that's a no brainer. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, you know, for for the consumer and for the the brewer. And actually, they can probably offer it at a, at a good price as well and make a decent margin and actually run a business. I mean, they have to run a business. Well, it's interesting you bring that up. So, I mean, the traditional alcohol channels in the past have gone producer to distributor to retailer to consumer. And nobody realizes that the cost of goods sold or the cost to produce that product is around 80 to 90% of, of margin. So at the end of the day, on a, let's call it on a $10 six pack, the producer walks away with, let's say, 90 cents or around a dollar. Um, what we've done by cutting out the distributor and the retailer is afford that producer to make about a 450 percent more net margin. Um, yeah. Well, that, that's that a decent, sit, yeah, that's a yeah. decent margin. I mean, they have to run a business. They have to pay people. They have to pay rent, and it's a struggle. You know, if if you get the, the distributor, then you have a retailer. I mean, it just cuts into your margin um, tremendously. And you have to make a large quantity of beer. And a lot of these small brewers don't have big systems. Like myself, we can only make like about 200 uh, gallons at a time in our fermenters. And we'll make like 40 cases and, and 20 cases get sold right away. And we have to keep 20 cases in reserve for uh, for a larger uh, retailer like a Hannaford we, we have near us. And they, they, take, they buy a lot of beer, but we have to keep it in stock for them, which we want to do. But... Um, if there's an opportunity to sell directly to the consumer, I mean, I think it makes a, a lot more sense. Yeah. I mean, look, it, it, if you're looking at it from that perspective, you know, it, it, a lot of people don't even have that opportunity to self distribute, nor do they have the opportunity to get a distributor. So, you know, that, that makes it heavily reliant upon the tap room themselves. And, you know, I think what we offer is that additional, or, or that new sales channel for even that small brewer uh, or that small producer, because now all of a sudden, um, if they're, you know, have a pretty good demand locally or hyper locally and, and they're selling growlers and somebody can't make it in, we can get that product directly to them. It's not going through the retailer and it's not going through the distributor. So, you know, there's a great margin there of, of working with the direct consumer model. Um, as you can see from a number of, of, of other startups that are out there in the market, I mean, the direct consumer model allows, 
you know, the consumer, one optionality, which is very important, that people tend to forget about, that there is a consumer involved in, uh, in this equation. And, you know, the consumer does like optionality, and we've seen that, especially in the craft space. You know, dedicated craft drinkers will drink three and a half different, uh, you know, brands a month if they can. Um, and of those, they'll try a number of different products within that brand. And, you know, if, if you've gone to your local grocery store or liquor store, you, you know what's on the shelves, right? It's the Budweiser's, the Miller Coors, you know, the, you know, the constellations with Corona and whatnot. And, you know, I, I'm a craft beer drinker, so I go out looking for optionality. And, you know, if I can't see it, it's, it's kind of a bummer. You know, if I don't see it, you know, especially at the local stores where I shop. So, you know, I, I'm, you know, I look to a platform like, like myself, or I mean, like Bev, where I can get that product that I, I could normally get. And, you know, a classic example of that would be, you know, you go to like they did in the wine industry. Basically you went out to Napa Valley, you had a great experience, you got home, you realized you couldn't find the product. And next thing you know it, you know, you're drinking you know, the regular wine that you'd normally drink. Well, then all of a sudden direct to consumer wine loss change and you can get that sent to your house. And, you know, it's an experience and it's a remembrance and there's a number of, you know, of facets that go into that and we want to we want that same opportunity for consumers when they go to you know eugene oregon or when they go to you know when they go to san diego california or boulder colorado or wherever the case may be and you know we look at beer as you know our as our main focus as, as, yeah. and we you know and we really we really think that there's an experience there that that consumers are missing out on you know have not being able to get the products that they want to drink. Yeah, and I know, and you know, we since we started this uh, the Craft Beer Storm podcast, I've gotten a, a number of requests from people all over the country, and they're like, you know, I need your beer. I, send me your beer, Barra Brewing Company. I'm like, I, I would love to, but I can't. That's why when you sent me the email the other day, I'm like, oh, Bev, let's see what's happening with them, and the, and the conversation started, and and it's a way for somebody to get um to get get their beer shipped to them legally. And uh, it, it just makes a lot of sense. Now, how many states are involved? I think there's only a handful of states so far out of the 50 that are involved with this. Right. So on the receiving side, uh, so so as I mentioned with the wine industry and the cider industry, it's 44 to 44 shipping to receiving. Uh, the beer industry is a little bit more skewed than that. So the beer industry is 22 shipping and um, and nine receiving. That's like DC. ridiculous. So, Nine receiving yeah. out of 50. That's like ridiculous. That's another reason why yeah, I wanted to have you on just to kind of emphasize this point. And I mean, how do we, how do we change that? What do we do? Well, my pitch, you know, I was just about to, you know, mention that. I mean, if you're a state legislator and you're listening to this and, you know, you want to make some additional tax money and, you know, change some laws within the state and allow producers to ship directly to your consumer. I mean, there's a tax ad value there. So, you know, from an economic perspective, as well as, you know, from a make, make your constituents happy perspective. I mean, that's but, the incentive, you know, right? I mean, cause if they, if I ship to California, it's a California tax, right? Uh, that would be the case if California allowed it. Yes. I mean, that, that is true. So, so know, the state that the, receives it is the one that receives the tax. Am I correct? Or, because that's, that's where that's the, 100. Yeah, so then that's it's correct. an incentive for you know for for lawmakers and and states to just get on board with this because the beer industry is a multi billion dollar industry, you know it, it's just it's ridiculous and I'm not sure how many bees but it's I, I got to look it up but you know there's huge potential for these states um, to to get some some additional revenue in which would help their yeah. their own people right. Yeah, so the so the Brewers Association, the nonprofit organization out of Colorado, put together the numbers for 2017, and you know, focused solely on the craft beer segment of the entire U.S. beer market, and we're talking about a 26 billion dollar market. Huh. Um, you know, and and, <laughs> and, and that's a huge great. market. In yeah. last in last year, you know, what we find really interesting is last year, direct to consumer in the wine space did about two and a half billion dollars of online sales. So if you look at how much beer online was done last year, which was zero, there is a tremendous amount of alcohol to consumer demand directly from the producer. Yeah. And I think where we stand right now with Bev is affording those, you know, consumers the option and optionality to to purchase directly from the producers in the beer and the cider space. And that's really, you know, what we're looking to lay precedent down with. 
is yep. allowing allowing a new sales channel for for all size breweries from hyper local to huge um you know to to have a new sales channel alongside their current distributors if they happen to have them i mean we're not here to compete with the distributors uh, they're their own entity but um you know there's there's a place for them but there's also a place for direct to consumer sales and it really comes down to how the producer the brewer or the wants to really you know, run their business and it shouldn't be one model. And no, it shouldn't. You know, yeah. unfortunately the the distribution markets really kind of made it a one model or, or, or nothing, you know, industry. Yeah, and that's unfortunate. And it's the, the there's antiquated laws on the books that are slowly being overturned. And I think distributors serve a very, very good purpose and a big purpose if they want to deliver a large quantity of beer to supermarkets. I mean that's fantastic. Um, you know, larger beer companies, you know, the big beer, they're good. They have their their niche. You want to go to a baseball game and you want to have a beer. That's fine. Uh, you mow the lawn. You want to have a beer. That's okay. But there should be an avenue for uh, and an outlet for uh, craft brewers who are, who are trying to build a business to to get their product directly to the consumer without all the middlemen in it. I think I think it just it's natural and it will happen. I'm not sure. You know. I mean, if we get enough people on board, we could probably push it through. Hence the. The, the podcast, you know, everybody will be listening to it. You know, the world will be listening to it. So, um, well, Michael, you asked you asked an interesting question before. What do you what, what should you do? How do you change these laws? You know, yeah. it really comes down to, you know, reaching out to legislation. Um, if you are in a state uh, that doesn't allow for direct consumer, or you're not sure, um, well, if you're not sure, you can reach out to me. Um, if if you know that you're not, and you'd love to get product delivered to your door, I mean, reach out to your to your legislation, they're there for you. And, you know, uh, I would look to the appropriations committee. I would look into who is, you know, who is pro craft in, in, in your state and, and really kind of, you know, lobby behind it. And um, the, 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 con- the constituents voice is pretty powerful. And, you know, if there's enough, there's enough drive and demand for something. I mean, change can't happen. We've seen it. So I mean, yeah, you know, that I mean, would be my advice for a consumer. Would I would say uh, go to your local state uh, brewers association or craft beer guild and say, Absolutely. how can I help you? And you know, show up at the state legislature. A lot of people in New Hampshire like they will get teams of brewers and just go up there and block certain laws that are trying to be passed or, or, or repeal other laws. And we've been very successful in doing that. It's been chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. But the environment since I started has, has changed a, a lot, you know, and I, I've only been around, you know, actually a commercial brewer for four years and it's changed a lot well, in New Hampshire. So I think there's, there's a long way to go, but I think if you, if you get people behind you, go up to, you know, they have meetings, uh, you know, committees and, and just show up and, and voice your opinion. Exactly. And, and when you think an industry can never change, take a step back and look at what Uber did for oh, yeah. the li- delivery business and look what Airbnb did to hospitality. I mean, you know, they they got pushed back like you couldn't believe. And if you dig into the inside stories of changing antiquated laws, you know, you'll, you'll see the struggles that they had to go through and, and supersede in order to get to where they are today, rightfully so. I mean, you know, we're fighting and we're, we're inside of an industry that goes back to the beginning of time, but yet the laws pretty much are staying there. I mean, we're looking at still in a majority of states in the United States, um, prohibition laws dating back to the 1930s. Yeah. And These it's are really, really, it's really, really ridiculous. They don't make any sense and they need to be overturned and we need to get into the new millennium, really. So I, I think what you're doing is fantastic. Um, Thank you. What other Thanks challenges so do you see, like, you know, affecting your industry or the, or the craft beer industry? I mean, based in your opinion. Sure. Yeah. So um, outside of the of the main one, and, you know, I'm going to speak on behalf of the brewer side, you know, there again, I'm going to reiterate the fact that, I mean, and this is the obvious statement, there is there is enough shelf space. That's the biggest problem from from our perspective at Bev.com. What we're finding is the education component is is really the most difficult on our end, because, again, I'm going to go back to this is the third gener- third true ge- uh, generation of distribution. So, you know, to tell someone that you you can actually, as a brewer, you know, in certain states under certain, you know, under certain jurisdictions, you can sell direct to consumer. The brewer takes a step back and says, so you mean to tell me that if someone, if one of my friends in, let's say, San Francisco, and I'm a brewer in, in let's call it San Diego, purchases my product online direct for me, 
that I can ship it up to them. And I tell them, yes, the answer is correct. And they go, hmm, that's really interesting. I would have had no idea. So, you know, we're finding education being a really, a really um, big issue. And then on the consumer side, really making consumers aware that this is something that's going to happen and, and is currently happening, you know, right under their noses. And, you know, we, we just want to let them know that we're here for them, both on the consumer and the producer side, you know, to help uh, educate as best we can and, and, and offer this new sales channel. Yeah, and I think what you're doing is great. You're setting up a platform for the next, um, you know, for for beer. I mean, wine is out there, and and it's just it's kind of ridiculous. It doesn't make sense, but I think I think what you're doing is great. Um, Thank you. And um, winding down, like why do you, why do you think people should go local? Try to drink a local craft brew or find breweries maybe outside of their state, but it's locally produced, smaller brewers. I mean, you know, what is the advantage of doing that over just going down to the store and buying a uh, a suitcase for ten dollars, you know, of twenty four cans? Sure. I mean, it comes it comes down to a couple different things, and it depends on what your personality is. But I think really, you have to remember at the end of the day, um, there is a small business out there that's producing this product, and <clears throat> by purchasing direct from these producers. You're helping you're helping them as a small business grow and and, and stay alive in some cases um, and that's very very important. This is an industry where it's a passion industry. The small business owner loves what they do; they wouldn't do it otherwise. Um, and you know, help them if you're going to drink beer and you're going to drink cider. You know, buy it from the producer or buy local because believe it or not, that there is somebody at the end of that pipeline that's very very grateful and. You know, again, it comes down to the to the producer and and their business. Um, again, there's and, and there's a lot of, of, of flavor profiles out there as well. Um, you know, flavors differ by state. Flavor profile: an IPA in New England is going to be very different than an IPA in the Midwest, which is going to be very very different from an IPA in the Pacific Southwest. Yeah. So, you know, by by just saying, oh, I've got IPA at my local retailer. Well, you may have IPA, but IPA is so broad. And so many different, you know, hops and, and and ingredients go into it that you know don't just think that IPA tastes like your local storefront. You know what you have at your local storefront. There is a lot of stuff out there, and you may really, really, really be surprised as to you know what you like and don't like. And and it's about experimentation as well. Right, and you know the IPA thing. A lot of people, a lot of people have to be educated. Um, you know, the, the mass, and that's one of the other reasons why I started this podcast was because I, I just walk into stores and I see ninety percent it's these watery lagers uh, that you know are, are considered beer, and I mean they are beer, but there there's there's just a ton of alternatives and a ton of different styles as well. You know, darker beers and. Uh, you know, IPAs, but there's loads of different hops. I mean, one IPA can be different, you know, to another IPA. I mean, just the, based on the hop you used or the concentration of hops or, Absolutely. and that's what people need to be educated on it and go out and venture and, and try to support your local. <laughs> but also if there's something else that, you know, you see uh, in a different part of the country that's becoming popular and you want to get your hands on it, you can't go down to the local store, but there's a way to get that through your platform, which I think, which I think uh, serves, it creates a lot of value for people, which is great. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the, you know, the plugs and for helping us uh, get our name out there. Um, we're starting out small and we're hoping to grow big and we're just like any other small brewery, you know, we're, we're looking to grow and, and I take it to the next level. So, yeah. you know, thanks again for this time. No, I, really I do. I, I, I appreciate you because you have a lot of passion about it. I have a lot of passion about it too. I make the beer. I have a lot of passion. You you like to distribute the, the beer or allow a, uh, a platform where people can go and buy what they want, which is, which is awesome. And that's the way it should be. Now, how can people get a hold of you uh, if they want to uh, shoot some questions at you or brewers want to sign up? How do they get a hold of you? Sure. So I'll give you uh, two different domains. So our, our, our general domain is Bev, B E V V dot com. And if you're a vendor and you're looking to learn more, um, go to Bev dot com forward slash onboard. That's forward slash O N B O A R D. And that'll give you all the information. We also have our FAQ there um, at, at, in the footer of that page. And if you'd like to contact me directly, <clears throat> uh, please feel free to email me at info, I N F O, at Bev dot com. And either myself or one of my colleagues or co-founders will get right back to you. 
Um, we share that email so uh, we can give the best customer service that we can as a very small startup. And, uh, you know, please shoot us your questions. Um, we'll do the best that we can to answer them. And if we can't answer them, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to lie to you. We'll tell you we can't. So, you know, please feel free to reach out. Well, that's great. No, I appreciate you. I appreciate what you're doing. And uh, everybody, Bev.com, it's a uh, you know, great website. I think what they're doing is fantastic for brewers and consumers as well. It's the natural progression. This is the next step. Uh, Thank you, Michael. We, we got to get it going. Get, get a hold of your local legislator. You know, go to your local state house and you know, make a noise because it's, this is the way it should be. All right. Agreed. Okay, brother. Well, thanks for, for coming on. Cheers, Michael. Thanks again. Have Cheers. a great day. You too. Cheers. Hey, yeah, that was Travis Benoit from Bev.com, B-E-V-V.com, a platform that he's developing for brewers to sell their beer directly to consumers. I think it's a great platform and it makes a lot of sense. Wine can be shipped all over the place. Uh, and beer can't, which is ridiculous, I think. Uh, but it's a state by state thing. So if your state does not allow it, um, go to your legislature, uh, you know, local legislator, and say, hey, you know, we need this overturned. Go to the state house, make your voice heard. Contact the local, uh, you know, each state has their own craft beer guild or, or brewer association. Contact them, um, get a bunch of people together, and, and get it done. Uh, it's a slow movement, but we're going to do it. Um, and I think it makes a lot of sense for these smaller brewers uh, to to sell directly, especially for me. I would love to do that, you know. But um, listen, if you like this podcast, if you like what we're doing, if you like the trend that we're going on, the the trajectory, we need you to go to iTunes. We need you to give us a rating and a review. Would be fantastic. Also, tell a friend that uh, we exist. And check us out. And that's the only way we can get the message out there. So that's our, our podcast for today. And we'll see you guys next time.